So we're always changing things. We have a new wireless microphone. Hopefully the sound quality will be a little bit better. And it allows me no, no cords. I can walk anywhere I want to now. So that, that's good for me. Um, are there any questions on anything that we've covered so far? <laughs> Too many to count. <laughs> well, okay. Understand that um, confusion is completely normal. Really, seriously. And we're going to go over a lot of stuff tonight as well. This is another jam-packed chapter. And um, a lot of it, you'll, you'll go right over your head and you'll say, I didn't get any of that. But just keep going, go back, read over the material, look over the, the, the uh, information we'll provide. And slowly but surely, it will uh, come to you and you will pick things up from it. So trust me, this, this is a process and it works. Now, we are outpacing the videos of uh, Dave Kassler. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, he has not yet released any Chapter 4 videos, or I would have sent you links uh, to those. Uh, but as soon as he does, I'll send you links to his updated videos. Uh, I want to wait until he does that so he covers the material that's in the updated question pool to make sure that uh, it, it's in sync with what we're doing. So let's get started. Uh, we'll go through a few sections, then we'll take a break, and then we'll come back. Uh, and tonight we're going to show you a lot of stuff, a lot of things that um, if you've had some radio background or electronics, some, some lore, we're going to talk about standing wave ratio. And I'm going to show you tonight a standing wave. Bet you never saw one of those before. So let's get started. So I want to define some terms of art. Uh, radio waves, uh, we talked about those uh, earlier on that, that radiate from an antenna, those are electromagnetic waves. They have uh, the, uh, an electric field and a magnetic field. We'll talk more about that. So radio waves are electromagnetic waves and they can travel to a certain distance and that's generally called the range. That's the distance over radi which radio transmission can be received. And for line of sight transmission especially, we're interested in uh, the radio horizon. How far from your location can you get out, can you see? And for VHF and UHF, we say that they're line of sight. You'll see that there's a little change to that. But, uh, and here we have the little man walking in the curve there. Uh, and he's got a radio up to his head, so he's about six feet tall. How far can he? transmit before the curvature of the Earth uh, gets him into trouble, about three and a half miles. So if there is nothing, if there's no obstructions, this is called the bald Earth, if there's no trees, there's no buildings, the radio at six feet up would go about three and a half miles. Now, if there's another guy out there uh, that's three and a half miles away from that point of the curvature of the Earth, theoretically the radio might travel up to seven miles. But that's the theoretical maximum. So if you see a radio being advertised uh, and says, oh, it'll go 20 miles, well, maybe with some help, maybe from a mountaintop, maybe from, but on flat Earth, the max is generally from handheld to handheld, about seven miles. And that's theoretical. Well, that's without trees, that's without buildings. So VHF, we say the VHF bands start with six meters, so 50 megahertz and above, although six meters has some interesting characteristics that kind of move it also into the shortwave or high frequency bands. But um, generally VHF and above are line of sight. So if you have a mountain uh, in between you and your desired you know, target, you're going to have an issue. However, if you've got a tall tower, well that changes the equation. And so that's why a lot of hams like very tall towers that they're ham shags. This is an interesting phenomenon that for light, um, it really does go out in a straight line. But radio waves will actually 
hug the Earth just a little bit more. Uh, and the ARRL likes to say that uh, the Earth is less curved for radio waves. So radio will kind of bend and go a little bit farther than actual light will. So you can use some techniques with VHF and UHF to improve uh, your uh, ability to, to get around obstacles. And one of these is known as knife edge diffraction. If there's something in the distance that maybe is blocking you, but you see that there's a sharp point, maybe it's a building with a, a, sh a sharp roof or a sharp side, you can use that to your advantage if you direct your energy somehow with a directional antenna toward that building, toward that sharp edge, the radio waves will diffract around a sharp edge, whether it be on the top or on the side. This is called knife edge diffraction, and you can actually go around buildings. Uh, using VHF and UHF, using this technique. Now, one thing that happens though with radio waves is that they don't go in just one direction. Typically, especially from a handheld with an omnidirectional antenna, they're going to go all over the place. And then they might knife edge diffract around one building, or they might reflect off of another building. And so what happens is that from the transmitting station, here we have it on a tower, there might be multiple paths that will get the signal to the handheld. Multipath reception can be good or it can be bad because you don't know whether those signals are going to be additive or subtractive depending on the length uh, that they have traveled and their uh, relative phasing. So you can actually have radio signals coming in from multiple paths and cancel. We'll talk more about that here in a second. I had a problem at my house uh, near Furman University uh, before they put a translator on Paris Mountain. I couldn't receive the Channel 7 signal uh, from the Spartanburg area. It's on a, a mountain. Uh, Paris Mountain was in the way. And so how the heck am I going to receive Channel 7? I'd, I'd like to be able to receive that. Well, I found I had a, an antenna on the roof of the house that if I turned my antenna toward downtown Greenville, I would be able to receive reflected signals from the buildings in downtown Greenville, and I'm able to receive Channel 7. So that's VHF and UHF there as well. So you can look for a path that might get the signal there, either through refraction or reflection. So how many of you have been in your car and you're listening to your favorite FM station, VHF, and you, you come to a stoplight and you stop the car and all of a sudden the radio signal just goes right down to nothing. But then you creep the car up maybe about a foot or two feet and all of a sudden the signal starts coming back up again. That is multipath. When you stopped the first time, and you were receiving from different directions, the signals were canceling. And so you lost the radio station. But as you creep up a little further, you're changing the equation of the signals coming to your antenna, and all of a sudden you had stronger signal again. They were adding together again. So that's multipath. And multipath can occur on all frequencies. We've talked about VHF and UHF, but also on high frequencies, short waves. Multipath uh, can uh, happen there. You think of the old World War II movies, and they're huddled over the shortwave radio, and they're listening to Edward R. Murrow in London talking about the bombing, and his signal comes up, and his signal goes down to almost nothing, then it comes back up again. That's multipath on short wave or multipath on the high frequency bands. And you can hear that uh, also still today. You may hear somebody tell uh, somebody who, if they were in a QSO on the Caesar's head repeater, for example, and they're, they're talking, and all of a sudden the one guy's signal goes to heck. And you, you can't hear him anymore. And so the, generally somebody will come back and say, hey, Tom, you're off your X. What that means is that there's maybe in your house even, uh, you'll find a place where you can reliably reach the repeater, Caesar's head or whatever, that you want to reach. 
But if you move over here to get something or whatever else, you're off your X and your signal will go down. Multipath happens on transmit as well as receive. So, yeah, Tom? As a matter of fact, uh, <laughs> this is a poor example, but it's still an example. Uh, in my recliner, which I spend a lot of time, if I'm leaning to the right, I can get out fine. If I lean to the left side of my recliner, I'm off my X. It and, can and be it that can critical, exactly. So if you hear somebody say, hey, you're off your X, that's what they're talking about. You're off your, your sweet spot. And for um, communications involving computers, uh, packet radio, um, other digital modes, um, what can happen there is with multipath, uh, the data stream will become corrupted. Uh, you won't get good ones and zeros. It'll be garbled and you'll get a lot of errors. Your error rate on the transmission will go up, a lot of retries. And so that's what happens with multipath with uh, digital data communications. Uh, you, your bit error rate will go way up. And the same technique, maybe moving the antenna uh, for your transfer may improve things. So what do you think for VHF and UHF signals, what do you think uh, would range be affected by leaves on the trees? Absolutely yes. Because of the shorter wavelengths of VHF and UHF, um, and trees can be uh, absorptive uh, or reflective. So yes, you're going to get much greater range in the winter than you will in the summer. Uh, I say greater, maybe 10, 15, 20 percent. It, it, all, it all depends on, on what's going on, but just keep that in mind. If someone is driving along and they're talking mobile on one of the repeaters or even simplex, you may hear their signal start chopping up and down. You might hear strong signal, weak signal, strong signal, weak signal, strong signal, weak signal. Strong. And what is that? What's going on there? That's called picket fencing. And it's like a picket fence with the, you know, the lats there, that um, if you have buildings or other objects behind you as you're driving along, this happens in the metropolitan areas a lot as well, um, that signal strength will be additive, subtractive, additive, subtractive, additive, subtractive. So this up-down signal strength on VHF and UHF is called picket fencing. So I got a question here for you. A VHF signal might have a wavelength like so, and a UHF signal might have a wavelength like so. Which do you think is going to better penetrate a building? The answer is the UHF, just because of openings in the building, like the windows or whatnot, a UHF signal can more easily penetrate and maybe get reflected around inside the building. But UHF has better reception and transmission capabilities from buildings than UH, uh, VHF signals do. So here's a story. Back in the 1980s, I worked for WNEM television in Saginaw, Michigan as an engineer. And it was the time that uh, NBC, it was an NBC affiliate at the time, uh, decided we're going to go off of our microwave uh, network distribution and we're going to follow PBS and we're going to go into the satellite distribution system. We're going to have our, our own transponder space on a satellite and we're going to you know, beam our, our network signals for the East Coast and for the West Coast and, and, and affiliate feeds and all that. But instead of it doing it on a microwave with AT&T, we're going to have it on our satellite and we're going to transmit it. Oh, but we're going to do it different than PBS. PBS used a C-band satellite. We're going to use KU band satellite systems because it's the latest technology. And so I was there when this happened. We, we put the systems up and, and everything you know, would generally work just fine. This is the 1980s, remember. Um, KU band, these are microwave frequencies of 11 to 15 gigahertz. Same as your DISH network or your direct TV. These are KU band satellites as well. And what do you think might be a problem? You saw the DISH back there. It was pretty good size. But the problem is rain fade. The wavelength of the KU band 
system, it's between one and two centimeters, water droplets will absorb or reflect or refract. And so every time it would rain, even with that big satellite, antenna that we had at the TV station and even with high power NBC was pumping up to, to go to the satellite, we'd lose the network signal. So PBS didn't have that problem because they were on C-band, which is a much lower frequency range, much larger wavelength. It was unaffected by rain. Same thing at home if you have DISH or direct TV and it rains heavy, you're going to lose your signal. It's because of this. So, here's another thing that might impact propagation, or will it? Fog and light on the 6 and 10 meter bands, will there be any um, effect on propagation? No. <laughs> this is a confusing question, but you might see it on a test. Um, oops. Um, 6 and 10 meter wavelengths are too long. So they're not going to be impacted. They're like the C-band satellite, only much bigger. Uh, they're going to get right through rain and light. Light has no impact on radio waves. So this is a, a distractor question, but I want you to, to see it directly. So there are generally uh, two kinds of uh, propagation. Now here we're talking about for medium wave frequencies primarily, uh, between about 500 kilohertz and up to about uh, 2 megahertz. Um, there are two modes of propagation. One is along the ground, called the ground wave, and one is up to the sky, up to the ionosphere. And uh, let me introduce the ionosphere to you right now. It's, it's the layer of the Earth's atmosphere that is primarily responsible for long distance radio propagation. So that's the ionosphere. You know, you've heard of the stratosphere and the mesosphere and a bunch of other. Ionosphere. Think ion or being ionized. That's the area that's of importance to, to radio enthusiasts. So a medium wave station on AM, the AM band will have two signals that will go out. And during the day, the ground wave is the effective means of propagation for AM radio stations on those frequencies. But at night, you can start to hear stations coming from a long ways away. The mode shifts, and the sky wave signal becomes important. Well, why is that? Well, first, the ground wave, it will actually go further than the curvature of the Earth. Why is that? I like to think of it as the, the radio wave drags its feet along the Earth, and the radio wave starts to tilt around the curvature of the Earth. So AM radio stations with sufficient power can actually go beyond the curvature of the Earth. You can see here this tilting effect uh, as the, the wave travels until finally it kind of falls over and uh, can't go any further. This is the ground wave propagation. This is daytime propagation for AM stations. So at night, the ionosphere, and here are the various layers we talked about, troposphere, um, stratosphere, the mesosphere, and very top is the ionosphere. And that's what we're concerned about. And the ionosphere has multiple layers. The lowest layer is called the D layer. Next up is called the E layer. And then on top of that is the F layer. And actually, the F layer is divided into F1 and F2, but D, E, and F. I like to call the D layer the dead layer. The D layer only appears when the sun is shining. Because of all of the energy coming from the sun, it ionizes the ionosphere all the way down to the D layer. And the D layer absorbs the ground wave signal from AM radio stations. So that's why you don't hear long distance AM radio during the day. It's because of the D layer of the ionosphere. But at night, when the sun goes down, the D layer rapidly fades away, as does the E layer. And you're left with predominantly the F layer. And then the sky wave signal, which was always there, is allowed to be refracted back down to the Earth via the ionosphere. And so 
And um, I love this time of the year because now when we leave here tonight, do something you have, haven't done probably in a long time. Take your car radio and tune it to the AM band. And just start tuning around. I was listening to WJR. I'm from Michigan originally. So on 760, WJR in Detroit uh, always used to be the, the big powerhouse station in Michigan. And it was interesting to, to hear them you know, driving home last night from the general class list, listening to WJR. I mean, you can listen to WABC in New York. You can listen to WSB in Atlanta. And this is called medium wave DXing, to try to listen to medium wave stations from as far away as, as you possibly can. And this is a route that some people use to start to get into radio, uh, the radio hobby. Here's another look at the layers. Um, during the day, you have the D, the E, the F1, and the F2. At night, you have a little bit of the E, but more of the F layer, the highest layer. And because it's the highest, it'll um, actually send radio waves the farthest, just to, due to the geometry. So there is something called the critical frequency. Uh, and below this frequency, radio waves have you know, frequency and wavelength. Below this frequency, radio waves will be refracted back down to the Earth. But above that frequency, the critical frequency, radio waves will just keep going out into space. They might be refracted back a little bit, uh, like that 100 megahertz signal you're seeing there, but it still won't come back to the Earth. So have you ever wondered when NASA was uh, you know, doing their uh, manned space program, the space shuttle, and if you're as old as I am, I remember Mercury and Gemini and Apollo, when they were talking to the spacecraft, uh, either in orbit or heading to the moon, they were using UHF frequencies. Well, UHF, why wouldn't they use shortwave? You know, shortwave goes you know, long distance. What? Shortwave would have been refracted right back down onto the Earth and never would have made it out to the spacecraft. But UHF is always above the critical frequency. And so UHF signals will always go through the ionosphere and out into space. So that's why manned space stations still today use UHF as their primary critical frequencies. And here's another look at the ionosphere. The ionosphere is what makes the magic happen. Now, is the ionosphere something that you can count on all the time, every day, to be the same? Absolutely not. <laughs> it varies uh, from moment to moment sometimes. But we'll talk a, a little bit about that and give you some tools so you can investigate how the ionosphere is today. So moving away from the ionosphere a little bit, um, sunspots. On the left is a picture of the sun with sunspots. And on the right is a picture of the sun without sunspots. We are in that period um, of the sun's cycle where we have no sunspots right now. Now, sunspots are good for ham radio. Um, because of uh, sunspots, uh, the ionosphere gets ionized in such a way that during the day, signals on 6 meters and 10 meters will go an awfully long distance with very little power. And technician license holders, as we talked about earlier, can, can have some voice privileges right now on 10 meters. And when the sunspots are booming, you can talk around the world with 10 watts on 10 meters. Um, but uh, right now, no. And the sunspot cycle is an 11-year cycle. And so if you look at this chart here, uh, we're uh, entering into the solar cycle number 25. Um, and the you are here, you've got to move it over actually a, a couple clicks. But um, we're coming down to the bottom. We're coming down to the, the very lowest um, point in the sunspot cycle, and then it will start coming back up again. So we're about five, six years away from another sunspot peak. Now, how high will that peak be? How good will it be? We don't know. 
you can see this only shows you um, uh, a couple of the cycles, uh, and you can go online and, and, and take a look. They've been much higher. There have been times of really huge sunspot activity. 1957 was supposed to have been amazing for radio propagation. Think about it. This was back in the days of tubes, back before single sideband. Um, people were talking on uh, two watt tube radios around the world. It, that was an amazing year. So anyway, that's what's going on with sunspots. Before there were satellites that enabled long distance communications, and I used to work for the Voice of America. The Voice of America is the US government's international broadcasting arm. And, and back when I first started in 1988, we had a lot of high powered short wave transmitting stations. And, and one of the facilities was in the Philippines. And we had a receiver site um, in, up in the mountains at Baguio uh, and a transmitting station site at Poro Point, uh, which is down uh, along the, the coast uh, toward China. And so programs would be received at the receiver site in Baguio on international shortwave radio receivers. So you'd actually re re receive from the United States, from California likely, uh, via shortwave, and then rebroadcast it, pump it back into transmitters to, to rebroadcast into to China or South Asia. Well, they wanted a, a reliable way to get programming, the, the audio signals, from um, Baguio down to Poro Point. Microwave wouldn't work because it was mountainous. It was irregular. They wanted a reliable way, something they could count on. And what they found was tropospheric propagation, tropo. And you see the antennas there on the right. They look like satellite antennas, but they're not pointed up to the sky. They're pointed at the horizon. Or in Baguio, they actually kind of pointed down because they were pointing toward Poro Point. And you can get reliable communications using tropospheric scatter or tropospheric uh, communications over 300 miles reliably. Now, this was only about 50 kilometers, so this, this was no problem whatsoever. So tropospheric propagation is one way you can get reliable communications on VHF and UHF frequencies out to, up to 300 miles. And another way that you can get tropospheric propagation is more irregular, and this is through ducting, thermal ducting. And I like to say tropo, I, I think of tropical, I think of heat you know, and humidity. And so thermal layers, and so if you have a temperature inversion, normally you have cold air on the top, warm air on the bottom. But if for whatever reason you get cold air on the bottom and warm air uh, up above it, that's a great candidate for tropospheric ducting and for s sending signals on VHF and UHF over a long distance. Backscatter. We're going to go over a lot of terms tonight. Don't worry about it if you don't get it right at first. It'll come to you. But backscatter is when you're sending a signal up to the ionosphere, and you know, your target is thousands of miles away, you would hope. But some of that signal will come back, come back toward your station. And so your buddy down the street you know, in, in your same neighborhood may hear your signal weekly. And that's coming from backscatter communications. That's, that's coming from signals being reflected back off of the ionosphere. All right, this is an interesting mode. Uh, there are regular meteor showers, and I think in the book there's a table uh, that tells you when uh, meteor showers uh, will occur. And amateur radio operators have figured out ways to bounce signals off of the trails of meteors, the tails of meteors. So, um, and six meter, the six meter band, the wavelength, six meters, is just perfect for meteor trails. And so you'll see hams who, when the, the meteors come, they'll, they'll look up and see where they're going to be in the sky. They point their antennas at them and they make communications via the, the meteor trails. All right, aurora. One thing that um, will happen if there's, um, uh, disturbance on the sun, 
it'll send particles to the Earth. And those particles uh, will actually interfere with the magnetic fields of the Earth. And the result in the northern hemisphere is the aurora borealis. In the southern hemisphere, it's the aurora australis. And pretty lights, but it disrupts radio communications uh, in the northern latitudes. And so generally, hams don't like aurora, except, there's always an exception, some hams have figured out that you can actually bounce radio signals off of auroras. And so on six meters, you can see the radio there is tuned to 50.13 uh, megahertz. Here is a QSO from Victor Echo 3 Echo November in Canada who points his six meter antenna. Whoops, get back there. Toward the aurora, I want to turn this up. Now, I want to warn you. Aurora signals have varying signal strength and they're known for their distortion. So this is going to sound like an evil voice from hell. So don't have a heart attack in the class. All right, let's try this. Five and eight, Aurora. Five and eight, Aurora. Fox November 3-2. Uh, call is Kilo Charlie 2. Whiskey Lima Radio over over. Yeah, QSL, nice to see you again. And beautiful signal on the Aurora. Five and nine, Aurora here. 59, Aurora. Fox Norway 2-5, over. QSL, Kevin, you're also 59, 59, 73. Thank you. 73 and good luck. Victor Echo 3, Echo November. I'm going to QSY up 5. QRZ, Victor Echo 3, Echo November. Victor Echo 3, Echo November. QRZ. Alpha, Alpha 1, Tango, Tango. Alpha, Alpha 1, Tango, Tango. Nice to see you. Nice signal. 5 and 7, 57, Aurora. Fox, Norway, 25. Fox, November, 25. Over. Yeah, QSL, please copy. 5 and 8, Aurora. Into the Fox Trot, November 33, FS 33. QSL, thanks for Fox, November 33, and enjoy the opening. Signals out there. Um, Alpha Alpha One Tango Tango Victor Echo Three Echo November Seventy Three. So that is an auroral contact with single sideband phone on six meters. Hams are a crazy bunch. Um, we were talking earlier this evening before class started about well you know I'm get my technician license, but I, I can't really talk very far because 10 meters isn't open right now because, you know, well, the sunspots and, and, and whatnot. The surprising thing is that the bands can open up because there's other modes of propagation. And one of these is called sporadic E. Remember we had the, the three layers of the ionosphere, the D layer, the E layer, and the F layer. Well, sometimes clouds of gaseous particles will form in the E layer. And actually, on frequencies 15 meters and above, these clouds can be used to refract or reflect radio waves back down to Earth. So if you have a sporadic E opening, you can go thousands of miles using this mode of propagation. And you know, people are bemoaning now because we're in the sunspot cycle and there's not these long distance signals. This weekend was the CQ Worldwide Radio Teletype Contest. And I talked to my friend Bill, N4IQ, this morning. And I said, well, how was it? He said, the bands were great. Signals were open on 15 meters, no problem. Um, not quite on 10, but, uh, and the thing is, when people get on the bands and start actually sending CQ or looking for, for other contacts, then contacts happen. So this weekend with a contest where people were sitting down trying to work as many stations as they could in a limited period of time, the bands opened up. Well, they were open all along, just people didn't know that. So uh, sporadic E coming from this, this 
cloud in the E layer can actually refract signals back down and you can make some really nice contacts even on VHF. On six meters I've made contacts from Greenville to California using sporadic E. Okay, we talked about the critical frequency. That's the frequency at which radio signals will, from anything above that, it'll just go right out into space. There are a couple of other um, frequencies that uh, you can find out about. They're called the MUF and the LUF. The MUF is the maximum usable frequency. The LUF is the lowest usable frequency. And these are calculated based on where you want to uh, transmit to. They're from point to point. So let's say between here and Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, we can calculate what is the MUF and what is the LUF, and we can put our signal really close up to the MUF, but not too high up, and that's where the most power efficiency is going to be for a signal to get from one location to another. Um, it varies by time of day and the direction of the signal. Um, the higher hand bands, uh, 10 meters, for example, work better during the day. Uh, lower high frequency bands work uh, better at night. So the muff and luff changes throughout the day. And we'll come back to a, a bit of uh, some tools that you can use to calculate and find out what the best propagation and what the best frequencies are. I did want to mention here the gray line. Uh, this is the, the area, I'm so used to having a cord. Um, here on the monitor you can see this band, this blue band, this is the sun here, and this is darkness over there. It's the area of twilight uh, at sunset and sunrise. And that band moves around the Earth as the sun rotates. And you can actually propagate radio frequency signals through the gray line area. And so a, a map like this can tell you from the United States where might an opening be. And th this looks like uh, to uh, uh, Moscow or St. Petersburg might be, be good uh, gray line propagation uh, at, at this time. All right, here's the tool I was going to tell you about. I worked for Voice of America. Well, they developed software, Voice of America Coverage Area Prediction. Because it was important for us to, you know, how are we going to get our shortwave signals into China or into the Soviet Union or into various places? We wanted to know, and so um, using your tax dollars, we developed predictive tools. Well, you can now use the same thing online for free at VOA Cap Online. There's a um, URL here, and you can put in characteristics about your station and characteristics about the target area that you'd like to reach, and you'll get this little rosette over here on the upper right that will tell you the best time and frequencies to use to listen for and to transmit to that particular location. So your tax dollars at work. It's basically tracking that band. Yes, and it uses real-time data uh, from various inputs to tell you. So uh, you know, today the rosette might look like one thing, tomorrow it might look a little bit different. I mentioned if the sun has a, a storm that emits particles coming to the Earth, you'll get aurora. This is generally called space weather. And we won't go too heavy into it here in this class, but as you go into the general and extra, we, we go a lot more in depth. Um, but there are various factors that can impact radio waves on Earth. And if you'd like to find more resources about this, here are some other websites uh, that uh, you can go to, to, to you know, take a look and get more information. Also, did you know we have our own weather girl? Space weather woman. This is actually, she's a doctor of uh, astrophysics, I think. Uh, Dr. Uh, Tabitha Scove, Tabitha Scove. Um, and so if you go to spaceweatherwoman.com, you can see the weather report for space weather. And she has gotten her ham license and so she actually gives a section on, you know, this will impact amateur radio operators. So it's, it's kind of cool. All right, let's answer some questions. What should you do if another operator reports that your station's two-meter signals were strong just a moment ago, 
but now they're weak and distorted. You're off your X. Try moving a few feet. Or lean over in your uh, recliner. Why might the range of VHF and UHF signals be greater in the winter? The leaves are off the trees. You've got less vegetation. And what term is commonly used to describe the rapid fluttering sound sometimes heard from mobile stations that are moving while transmitting? That's picket fencing. And which of the following is a likely cause of irregular fading of signals received by ionospheric reflection? It's the random combining of those signals arriving via different paths. And what may occur if data signals propagate over multiple paths? For data signals, data signals, sorry. For data signals, the signals are going to get garbled. They're going to, you're going to have problems and the error rates, the data error rates, bit error rates will climb. And which part of the atmosphere enables the propagation of radio signals around the world? Ionized by the sun, the ionosphere. And how might fog and light rain affect radio range on the 10 and 6 meter bands? Rain and fog will have little effect on those bands. And what weather condition would decrease range at microwave frequencies? Microwave, that NBC satellite system, precipitation. Yep. And why are direct, not via a repeater, UHF signals rarely heard from stations outside your local coverage area? It's a long way around the barn to remind you that UHF signals are line of sight. They are not refracted or reflected by the ionosphere. They just go out into space. And which of the following is an advantage of HF, high frequency, versus VHF and higher frequencies? Long distance ionospheric propagation is far more common on high frequencies. That's what we were hearing. We were listening on that receiver earlier from Twente in the Netherlands, and we were hearing somebody from Oregon. Uh, so th that was via ionospheric propagation. That was on the 40 meter band, by the way. And what is a characteristic of VHF signals received via auroral reflection? We heard it. Fluctuations and sound distorted. They sound downright evil. And which of the following propagation types is most commonly associated with occasional strong over the horizon signals on 10, 6, and 2 meters? This is where you can work long distance even without sunspots. Sporadic E clouds, those clouds that can appear in the E layer. And which of the following effects might cause radio signals to be heard despite obstructions between the transmitting and receiving stations? That's knife edge. And what mode is responsible for allowing over the horizon of VHF and UHF communications to ranges of approximately 300 miles on a regular basis? That, from the VOA, from um, Baguio to Poro Point using tropo, tropospheric scatter. And what band is best suited for communicating via meteor scatter? Had to do with the wavelength. It was just the right for the meteor's trail or tail. Six meters. Six meters for meteors. 
And what causes tropospheric ducting? Remember, we normally have cool air um, up high and warm air down below. But if you get an inversion in there, then you can have ducting. And what is generally the best time for long distance 10 meter band propagation via the F layer? So I didn't emphasize this, but let's puzzle this out. So 10 meters long distance propagation works best with sunspots, a lot of sunspots. All right? That's one thing about 10 meters. And 10 meters is also a daytime band. So put those two together. And you have A, exactly. And which of the following bands may provide long distance communications during the peak of the sun, <coughs> sunspot cycle? Excuse me. 10 meters and also 6 meters, the magic band can be magic during uh, sunspots. And which of the following bands, whoops. Why do VHF and UHF signals usually travel somewhat farther than the visual line of sight distance between two stations? The Earth seems less curved. All right, another section. We're moving right along. This is so much stuff. You're hanging in there. You're doing fine. So the most basic kind of antenna, uh, and the basis for a lot of more complex antennas, is the dipole antenna. Uh, and it consists of a feed line coming from a transmitter or transceiver that goes up to the middle. This is a center-fed dipole. Uh, goes up to the center, and then you have a quarter wavelength long wire going one way and a quarter wavelength long wire going the other way. This is known as a half wave dipole. And if you start attending my classes, you'll see me do this all the time. This means dipole. This means a horizontal dipole. And we talked about radio waves are electromagnetic waves. And the electromagnetic wave is made up of two parts, an electric field and a magnetic field. And so you see them here at right angles with each other, the electric field and the magnetic field. And here's another view. Um, and the antenna's polarity corresponds to the polarity of the electric field. So this is my horizontal dipole antenna. And so it's physically oriented horizontally. The electric field of this antenna would also be oriented horizontally. Now if I flip it, all right, now we have a vertical half wave dipole. And now the E field, or the electric field of this antenna, is also oriented vertically. So the polarization of an antenna not only refers to its physical polarization, but it refers to the polarization of the electric field. Remember, electric field, magnetic field, but electric is what we're talking about with regards to polarization. And here's another view of that. So here's a question. Which way are car antennas polarized? Hmm? Or hmm? They're polarized vertically. Um, and the, all the antennas you see mounted on cars, that's, that's their orientation. Now, here's a thought question. If you were at home and you wanted to work really weak signals, but you got all these yahoos out in their cars with their car transmitters transmitting, and you, you want to avoid their interference, this will give you about a 20 dB reduction in signal strength. We'll talk more about that as well. But yes, for weak signal work on VHF and UHF, where most VHF and UHF mobile units are vertically polarized, you're going to want to be horizontally polarized to, to, to reduce interference from those signals. And it's known as cross-pole isolation. And the satellite uh, folks, uh, 
started using this purposely. It allows them to get more transponders or more channels on their satellites if they put um, both horizontal and vertical probes in their low noise converters then they can receive some signals vertically and other signals horizontally even if the signal frequencies overlap. It gives you between 20 and 30 dB of uh, difference which is between a hundred and a thousand times of isolation just by doing that. So on high frequency you'll, you'll see some people will have horizontal dipoles for you know the 40 meter band and some people will have vertical dipoles for the, the 40 meter band. And so you think well you know does do I have that you know 20 dB or 100 to 1000 times difference? No. Because what happens is when the signal goes up to the ionosphere it gets tumbled by the ionosphere. And what comes back down is not what was sent back up or was sent up originally. And what comes down is something that they say is more elliptically polarized, kind of at an angle. And so that's why on high frequencies you can use either a horizontal antenna or a vertical antenna and both will talk to each other because of the tumbling in the ionosphere. All right, moving along. So this is a horizontal dipole and I said you know it's it's the most common kind of antenna and the but there is one antenna that you can't build. It's called an isotropic radiator. It's a theoretical construct that scientists use to make comparisons. It's what is known as a point source in space. Uh, those two things have to go together. It, it's a point from which energy radiates theoretically without any reflections. So even if you had a point source antenna on earth the problem is the earth reflects, clouds reflect, buildings reflect. So an isotropic radiator can't be built on earth. Can't even be built in space but um, so but it's used as a reference. And one thing you can do with an antenna um, to get, um, this has nothing to do with the isotropic radiator. Let me first off say that. It, it, it was round, but this is confusing. I realize this slide combination is confusing. Um, we talk about antennas with gain. Um, um, a vertically oriented antenna like this is an omnidirectional antenna. It, it'll send signal all the way around uh, without any, any, um, directionality. But you can make antennas that are directional and they do that by confining the pattern of the antenna so that it goes only in certain directions. We'll, we'll see some more pictures here that will clear it up but I want to change that the way those slides are. So this is a directional antenna. This is what they call a beam antenna. Um, and is it vertically or horizontally polarized? It's vertically, the, the elements are, are going like that. So this is a vertically polarized antenna. It's got a driven dipole element there. It's got some elements that they call directors that are out in the front. And it's got something in the back called a reflector. So this is a directional antenna. The most common high frequency in VHF, UHF directional antenna is called the Yagi. It properly should be called the Yagi Uda antenna. In fact if you go to the link there you'll re read the whole story and you'll find out it really should be called the Uda antenna because Yagi was a Japanese scientist and Uda was his assistant. And Uda came up with the concept and Yagi took the credit. <laughs> but anyway we call it the Yagi. Um, and um, a three element Yagi antenna consists of a dipole driven element in the middle a director element uh, which is on the right hand side here which is about 5% shorter than the driven element and a reflector element at the back which is about 5% longer than the driven element. And when you place them in a certain arrangement they actually will direct signal in one direction. 
And you can also have them for high frequencies. This is a, a high gain TH3 junior, which is a 20, 15, and 10 meter a tri band Yagi antenna. Is this vertically or horizontally polarized? It's horizontally polarized and it's big. Because it's used for those frequencies, you've got to have a big uh, rotor to actually turn it. So we talked a little bit about decibels. Uh, decibels are a way that you can measure gain or loss in a circuit. And engineers like them because um, you can do multiplication using addition. So we have to live with it. Um, it's just something that's part of our, our hobby. And this is one of those hobbies that there's, there's a richness to this hobby, to amateur radio. There's a lot, a lot of stuff here. And so this is part of the richness of the hobby. Anyway, decibels, um, a 1 dB difference in signal strength is about 20%. And so if you, you're looking for 1 dB, that's 20% up, or minus 1 dB is 20% down. 3 dB is the same as a 2 times power difference. 6 dB is the same as a 4 times power difference. In other words, if I uh, have a 100 watt transmitter and I send my signal to an antenna that has 6 dB of forward gain in one direction, it's the equivalent of me having a 100 times 4 or 400 watts of effective radiated power in that one direction. It's free gain. Just by choosing the right antenna that has gain, you, you get free power in, in one direction. And the beauty of it is it also works on receive. So you get a four times better receive signal. So that's why gain antennas are important. And um, the last one I'd like you to know is 10 dB. That's a 10 times power gain. So if you can re memorize these three, 3 dB is times 2, 6 dB is times 4, and 10 dB is times 10, you'll do fine. Um, and there are formulas you can go through. They're using logarithms to the base 10. We're not going to talk about those, not in this class. That's for another class. Um, and up in the right hand, upper right hand corner is something called an S meter. You'll find this on amateur radio transceivers, um, more for the HF bands than you will for VHF, UHF. This is a signal strength meter. And each one of the numbers up to uh, S9 uh, is called an S unit, a signal strength unit. And generally, the convention is that those are 6 dB per unit. 6 dB, four times. So an S9 signal is four times stronger than an S8 signal. And, and that's generally borne out. Um, the calibration on the meters can be a little bit off sometimes, but that's, that's the convention. All right. So here's the omnidirectional antenna that I talked about earlier that has signal going all the way around the, the vertically polarized antenna. The Yagi antenna has a pattern something like this. And it does that by removing coverage from some areas. You see off the side here, there's hardly any coverage. But in this direction, there's a lot of coverage. And toward the back, there's not so much. So by concentrating that donut shape of the, the omnidirectional into this shape, that's how you get antenna gain. And you actually get some signal rejection from, from the sides. So if you've got a noise source coming off the side, it'll actually help block out some of that as well. So that's why another reason why directional antennas are valued. And you have the main lobe. That's where the most gain is in the directional antenna. Side lobes, so it's the, the little things that are sticking out there. You have nulls. That's where it's not receiving much of anything. And uh, then the ratio of gain in the forward direction uh, to the opposite direction is called the front to back ratio. I just want to introduce you to these terms. All right. So 
we have dipole antennas and generally the, the convention is the dipole antennas should be at least a quarter of a wavelength off the ground. So for um, six meters a half wavelength would be three meters and a quarter wavelength would be one and a half meters. So for a six meter dipole antenna it should be at least one and a half meters off the ground. But as you go down in frequency the wavelength gets longer and so the higher and higher an antenna should be. So an 80 meter antenna should be at least 65 feet off the ground. That's about a quarter of a wavelength. Now do people run with antennas that are lower than that? Yes. But what tends to happen is that as the antenna comes lower to the ground the radiation from a dipole antenna will go up. And some people actually do this purposefully. Um, I used to teach uh, this class to a group of preppers. And they were always saying, Gary, what about these exotic Nivis antennas? Near vertical incident sky wave. They wanted signals that would go up and come right back down. That's what a Nivis antenna is. And for some tactical situations these are important. In fact in this terrain in this area uh, if I want to get a high frequency signal into say Hendersonville North Carolina well the Blue Ridge Mountains are, are kind of in the way but if I can put a signal up and have it come right back down then I can get coverage into mountain valleys. Uh, in Afghanistan for example Nivis antennas are used by the military for this sort of tactical communication. So that's one thing to know that the lower a dipole antenna is to the, to the ground, less than a quarter of a wavelength, the higher the radiation patterns will be until finally it'll, it'll become a nivus. It'll become an antenna that directs energy straight up. All right, let's answer some questions. What can happen if the antennas at opposite ends of a VHF or UHF line of sight radio link are not using the same polarization? Remember I said that there's about a 20 to 30 dB difference if you, you change polarization. So the signals could be much weaker <laughs> than if they were the same polarization. And what type of wave carries radio signals between transmitting and receiving stations? Radio waves are electromagnetic waves. And which of the following results from the fact that skip signals refracted from the ionosphere are elliptically polarized? It doesn't matter whether you're using a horizontal or a vertical antenna when you're dealing with the ionosphere because it's going to tumble it anyway. So either type of antenna can be used. And what property of a radio wave is used to describe its polarization? The orientation of the electric field. And what are the two components of a radio wave? You got Mr. Electro and you got Mr. Mechanic, uh, magnetic, mechanic, electromagnetic. And so, what is the approximate amount of change measured in decibels of a power increase from 5 watts to 10 watts? This is times 2, so it would be 3 dB. And what is the approximate amount of change measured in decibels of a power decrease from 12 to 3? 12 divided by 2 is 6 divided by 2 again is 3 so 6 dB or in this case minus 6 dB. Yeah. And what is the approximate amount of change measured in dB of a power increase from 20 watts to 200? By process of elimination, <laughs> this is the 10 dB. 10 dB is 10 times. And a radio wave is made up of what type of energy? Electromagnetic. Electromagnetic. And what is meant by the gain of an antenna? And 
and the, the increase in signal strength in a specified direction when paired to a reference antenna. And that isotropic is used, that theoretical antenna is used as the reference antenna for a lot of uh, manufacturer's specifications. That's the thread I was trying to bring in and I forgot. All right, let's take five minutes and come on back. You're doing great. So we're going to talk about feed lines and standing wave ratio. And I promise you, you're going to see a standing wave. So hang on. So for radio equipment, um, all of the equipment, the antennas and, and the transmission lines are going to have something they call the nominal impedance. If you look at the back of a, a transceiver or look in the specifications, it'll say the nominal impedance of the output of the radio is 50 ohms. That's typically the standard. And a lot of the cables that we use to get uh, energy to and from an antenna, you'll look at the rated impedance, oh, 50 ohms. Sometimes 75, but sometimes 50. Um, and then the antenna systems as well. And the idea with these nominal um, impedances, if they all match, you get the maximum transfer of energy from the transmitter to the antenna or from the antenna to the receiver. It works in both directions. And impedance, to, as a reminder, we're not going to go deep into this, um, but it's a combination of a resistance and a reactance. And it has to be, um, you can't just add them together because the uh, current and voltage are out of phase in a reactance. And so you have to use some sort of uh, vectorial uh, addition to get to the impedance. This is a combination of a resistance, which is on the horizontal line, and an inductive reactance, which is going up. And, and you can use the magnitude there to tell you what the impedance is. Here's a, another one. This is uh, with a resistance and a capacitive reactance. You can see the ca capacitive reactance goes down. And the magnitude of the impedance is the, the length of the, the long line there. That's enough of that. So feed line impedances uh, to, to feed an antenna from your, your transmitter or receiver, you can have various different kinds. You can have air insulated hard line. It can be either 50 ohms or 75 ohms. That's the good stuff. That's the lowest loss. This is what broadcast stations will use for their high power transmitters, air insulated hard line. Um, coaxial cable, you can get 50 ohm or 75 ohm coaxial cable. That's the most popular for amateur radio operators. It's very convenient to use. You don't have to take any special steps uh, to, you know, it can lie on the ground or it can be up in the air. Um, ladder line and twin lead, anybody remember TV twin lead? That, you have to take some special precautions. You have to keep it away from the mast. You have to keep it away from metal. Otherwise, back in the day of analog TV, you'd ca cause ghosting you'd cause some of the energy to be reflected back. Um, so um, they require some special handling. Ladder line is like an oversized twin lead and has an impedance of 450 ohms. They do have some good characteristics, however. So we have the half wavelength dipole. Here I am doing the thing. Um, and the length of the total antenna is a half wavelength for the frequency that you're using. So on the 40 meter band, a half of a wavelength would be about 20 meters. So that's, that would be about the length of the antenna. And again, here's a, a view of um, some of the, the feed lines that you might use to, to feed an antenna, the twin lead, the ladder line, and coaxial cable. Feed line losses. Losses in cable shows up as heating in the cable. And the, the TV twin lead, they have very low loss compared to coaxial cable. Coaxial cable has more loss. Um, but if signal is going to be lost in the cable, it actually heats up the cable. That's what happens to, to the wasted energy. And the number one rule of coaxial cable, Tom knows this, Rick knows this, 
Keep it dry. Moisture will increase losses in coaxial cable. It's the single most common point of failure. My antenna's not working right. I can't understand. You take the connector off and the water pours out. Oh, that's not good. So moisture, keeping coaxial cable dry is the number one concern. I talked about the good stuff, the air insulated hard line. And so here are some uh, cutaways you can see of various different power capacity uh, hard lines. One trick is though, moisture is also a problem for air insulated hard line. And they keep moisture up by pressurizing the, the, the cable. Um, you can see that it's, it's got open space there. And generally you pressurize it with nitrogen. Not at high pressure, maybe five to 10 pounds, but nitrogen uh, doesn't carry any moisture. You can also use dry air. This is compressed air that's been especially dried, but nitrogen is probably more common. You have to take special you know, care uh, with this uh, hard line, whereas coaxial cable, it's, it's easy. In any cable, as the frequency goes up, the loss will increase. And some cable types have different losses compared to other cable types. Um, but for any cable, the higher the frequency, the greater the loss. Here's RG58 coaxial cable, the little small stuff there on the bottom, and RG8. They're both 50 ohm cables. They're both used in amateur radio. But the RG8 has lower losses at all frequencies as compared to the RG58. So that's why you use a table. You look up the manufacturer's specifications, and you try to figure out, I want to operate on this frequency range. You know, how much loss, if, I'm, if my cable is going to be 100 feet long, how much loss am I going to have in that cable? And if it says you're going to have 3 dB of loss, what does that mean? half your power. You start out with 100 watts at one end, you're going to only have 50 watts out at the other end. And where does that other 50 watts go? It heats your cable. All right. We're going to go into some fancy schmancy stuff here. So you have the ocean, a long, continuous body, and it's got waves on the ocean. The waves are coming in, and they're coming in, and they're coming in, and they hit the shoreline, and they rebound. Because the shoreline, the cliff here, represents a discontinuity. It's not the same impedance that the, the surface of the ocean was. And so some of the energy bounces back. And so here we have a, a rebound wave. The wave comes in. It can't propagate any further, and so it bounces back. This is what happens on a coaxial cable or a transmission line. You're feeding radio frequency energy down the line. And if there's an impedance mismatch at the far end, some or all of the energy will come back toward the transmitter. So here is a wave that's, that's being partially reflected. Some of the energy is getting through, but some of the energy is sent back. And here's a, a partial reflection going from a high impedance to a low impedance. You notice that the polarity of the signal reverses. And that will happen as well. When you go from a high impedance to a low impedance, the, the rebound wave will come back, but it'll be inverted in polarity. From a low impedance to a high impedance, you get energy back, but it's not inverted. This also is true. And if you have an open cable where there's no connection whatsoever, or if you have a shorted cable where you short it out, all of the energy will come back on the open cable, though, it's the same polarity. On the shorted cable, it comes back inverted polarity. So these are the extremes. If you're 
on a 50 ohm transmitter, 50 ohm line, and you have an open, all of the energy is going to come back. Or if you have a short, all of the energy is going to come back. And that's not good. You don't want that. What we want is the source impedance to match the characteristic impedance of the transmission line to match the load impedance of the antenna or, or whatever system we're using. It transfers all of the energy, therefore, to be radiated by the antenna and you don't lose any of the energy. And this is what a matched impedance looks like. The energy comes out and is completely absorbed by the load. That's what we're looking for. So I told you we're going to take a look at some standing waves. And so when I Googled standing wave, well, this is what I got. This is not the standing wave that I was going to tell you about, though. This is the standing wave. And we had some CB years in here. There's a lot of lore about you know, standing wave. What we're seeing with the blue going from left to right, that's the energy that's going from the transmitter to an antenna. And if you look at the red, that's the reflected energy that's coming back from the antenna to the transmitter. And you notice that where they have peaks in the same direction at the same time, you get a combination. They, they add together. And that black line is a standing wave. It doesn't move on the transmission line. But it does have peaks and valleys. And so this, my friends, is a standing wave. And we want to avoid sta having standing waves on our transmission lines because they don't do any good. They just heat the coaxial cable. That's all they do. And so if you have a perfect impedance match with your antenna, you have a one to one standing wave ratio. And that's the goal. And you can buy uh, meters uh, that'll, that'll tell you, you know, what your, your impedance matching uh, is doing. We'll talk about that here in a sec. In fact, right now, um, a standing wave ratio meter, or SWR meter, is installed between the transmitter output and the antenna feed line. And it will tell you um, what the standing wave ratio is between your transmitter and the antenna system. It doesn't really tell you what's going on at the antenna, but it tells you what's going on with the combination of uh, the transmission line and the antenna. Um, you can also use something called a directional watt meter to find the standing wave ratio. Uh, and remember, the standing wave ratio is just a, um, telling you how well impedance matched your system is. The directional watt meter, this is a bird. Uh, it's got a gozina on one side and a gozauda on the other side. And it's got this slug here, which is calibrated for a certain frequency range and um, certain power level. And with the arrow pointed this way, it'll tell you what the forward power is going out. And if you take the slug and you rotate it 90 deg uh, 180 degrees, um, it'll then tell you what the reverse power is. And by knowing those two things, there's a, a chart on the back of the meter. You can calculate how good the impedance matching is, what the standing wave ratio is. So a standing wave meter or a directional watt meter can be used. And here's a table, which may be a little small to look at here. Um, but we're looking for a 1 to 1 standing wave ratio. A 2 to 1 standing wave ratio is acceptable. Most transmitters will, will, will handle that OK. Above a 3 to 1 standing wave ratio, you're getting 25% of your power coming back. So if you're sending 100 watts out, you're getting 25 watts back. And in modern solid state transmitters, there's no way, nowhere for that um, 25 watts to go except in the power transistors of the radio. And so you're going to heat up the power transistors, and heat and semiconductors don't go together. And so most radios will have protection circuits built in. And when they see reverse energy coming back, they'll start reducing the output power to protect the output transistors. Two to one is where that starts to kick in. Uh, so um, 
and you can see that on the chart there, um, the, the reflected uh, power, the reflection coefficient, more information than you wanted to know. Just know that, um, oh, and one thing about standing, standing wave ratio, the larger number is always first. So you can have a two to one standing wave ratio or a three to one standing wave ratio. You can't have a one to three. That doesn't exist. So if you see that as an answer on a test, it's right out. So um, we want one to one. Two to one, up to two to one is acceptable. That's when the transmitters will start protecting themselves. And anything above three to one, you're looking for trouble. So what can you do about that? Well, we talked about the rebound wave, uh, the ocean coming in and the energy coming back out. Well, you can generate something called what I call a re-rebound wave. If you put one of these boxes between your transmitter and the uh, transmission line going out to your antenna, you can fiddle with the knobs here. Uh, you're doing some impedance matching and generate another wave, so you've got energy going out, let's say 25% is coming back, but it hits the antenna tuner and is reflected back out to the antenna again. Then the same thing happens again. Um, and it's back and forth and back and forth. Now, as far as the transmitter is concerned, which is on the other side, the input side of this antenna tuner, it sees a perfect match. Oh, one to one. Oh, I'm happy. I'm going to generate 100 watts out all day long. What's happening, though, is you haven't really improved things other than making the transmitter happy. Uh, because there's still a mismatch. There's still 25% power coming back. Now, by sending it back out, some of that will be radiated again after a, a slight delay because it's got to traverse the transmission line. For amateur radio purposes, it doesn't matter. Most of the power will be radiated. But for television broadcasting, um, for uh, really high frequency work where time is critical, they can't have this because um, it'll distort digital signals, uh, this, this back and forth, and, and so they have to do other things. But amateur radio operators can get by using an antenna tuner, or it's also known as an antenna coupler, uh, to actually tune out the, the mismatch, the impedance mis mismatch of the system. And inside that tuner that will be a capacitor or an inductor combination, either an L network like this, which has the, the coil on the top on the input and the variable capacitor on the output, or you can have a, an arrangement here with two capacitors and an inductor. This is called a Pi network um, tuner. Um, and so the, the tuners are built in different configurations for different purposes. Let's answer some questions. What, in general terms, is standing wave ratio? The ratio of high low impedance and free line. Not really. What is it telling you? What is SWR telling you? It's telling you. It's telling you a how well a load is matched to your transmission line, how well your transmitter is matched to the transmission line, or how well the antenna is matched to the transmission line. SWR is just a way of looking at impedance matching. It's telling you, are you well matched or are you not well matched? Um, so what reading on an SWR meter indicates a perfect match? One to one. And why do most solid state transmitters reduce output power as SWR increases? To protect those output transistors. Otherwise, they'll overheat and burn up. And what does an SWR reading of 4 to 1 indicate in general terms? <laughs> bad is good. You know, bad is a good answer. OK, on, out of these uh, selections, though. It's an impedance mismatch, a really bad impedance mismatch. And what happens to power lost in a feed line? It's converted to heat. 
And why is it important to have low SWR when using coaxial cable feed line? You don't want to have 100 watts going out of your transmitter and 50 watts at the opposite end. You want to reduce signal loss. And higher SWR will actually increase signal loss because of that bouncing back and forth. You're heating it one way, heating it another way, heating it another. And so that if you've got 3 dB loss, you're going to have 3 dB loss coming back, 3 dB loss, so a lot more heating going on in the cable. So what is the impedance of most coaxial cables used in amateur radio? 50 ohms. 50 ohms. And why um, is coaxial cable used more often than any other? Convenience. It's the most convenient to use. And in general, what happens is the frequency of a signal passing through coaxial cable is increased. As you increase the frequency, the loss will also increase, absolutely. And what might cause erratic changes in SWR readings? Think about this. We looked at that open circuit and then that short circuit, and we saw waves being rebounded. If you have a loose connection, that's either going to be open or shorted, and it's going to you know, cause us all sorts of issues. So which of the following types of feed line has the lowest loss at VHF and UHF? The good stuff. Air insulated hard line. All right. Last section. And I don't know why they put them in this order, but they did. So now we're going to talk about practical antenna systems. How'd you like to have one of these in your backyard? Um, Voice of America has the last domestic transmitting station in Greenville, North Carolina. And I uh, served there for a number of years. And this is one of their 400-foot-tall um, um, low frequency uh, from about 6 to 12 megahertz curtain antennas. This antenna has an antenna gain of 20 dB. 10 dB is 10 times. Another 10 dB, 10 times, that's 100 times power gain. And if you feed it with a 250,000 watt transmitter, you have an effective radiated power of 2.5 million watts in the desired direction, which is why the Voice of America could transmit thousands of miles away and be heard with very strong signals, antennas like this. Your HOA is not going to go for this. But maybe they'll go for a dipole, especially if they don't see it. And so this is probably the most common kind of antenna being used um, certainly on the HF frequencies for amateur radio. And well, how long should it be? Well, here's the formula. Uh, 468 divided by the frequency in megahertz. So if you take 468 and divide it by 7.15, which is a 40 meter frequency, it'll tell you how long in feet the, the dipole antenna should be. Now that is assuming solid conductor wire. When you go to stranded wire, it goes a little shorter. And when you go with insulated stranded wire, it goes a little shorter still. That's because of a, velo of a velocity factor. So that's what that V is up there. That's the correction factor. So here they're saying 12 gauge, stranded, jacketed. So it's going to be slightly shorter than the, the, the basic formula. And here's what happens on a dipole antenna when it's being fed at the center uh, from a transmission line. The uh, red are the voltages along the dipole antenna. And you notice that at the center of the antenna, the voltages are really quite low. But at the ends of the antenna, they can be very, very high. And so that's why with a dipole antenna, you always have to have an insulator at each end. That insulator isn't there to look cute. It's there to block voltages from jumping onto the rope that's holding it up or to, uh, if you're supporting it with wire, to jump over to that. It serves a purpose to block the high voltage at the ends of a dipole antenna. 
look at the, the blue, that's the current on the antenna. There's very low current flowing at the ends of the antenna because the current's got no place to go. But at the center of the antenna, with one side of the antenna pushing against the other, kind of like a teeter-totter, the current at the center is the highest. Another way to look at that is the low impedance point or high current point of the antenna is at the center and the high impedance or low current point is at the ends. There's a lot that was said there. We're not going to go any further than that. And the radiation from the dipole antenna, this, we're looking down at the top of the antenna if, if this is a horizontal dipole. And you can see the, the waves radiating broadside to the antenna. And the same is true for receiving. It'll receive better broadside to the antenna. So if you had a general direction, you were wrong. Yes. So if you want to go that way, you want your antenna to be like this. Yep. And here uh, is an electromagnetic wave coming in. They're just showing the E field. Um, the E uh, corresponds to voltage. And you can see it inducing a signal in the dipole antenna, which is then taken down to the receiver. So looking down from overhead, the strongest pattern, this is kind of a figure eight, and this is right, for a dipole antenna that's a quarter wave above uh, the ground, uh, the strongest signal is going to be broadside to the antenna. It's going to be both sides, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, figure eight. See? Yep. Yeah, exactly. So two dipoles, one shorter, one longer. The shorter antenna is going to be for a higher frequency. The longer antenna is going to be for a lower frequency. Because with a lower frequency, longer wavelength, higher frequency, shorter wavelength. So let's say I've got an antenna and it's one length and I, I want to, to, to move it to a slightly higher frequency. What would I do with the antenna? I would shorten it. To move to a, a higher frequency, I shorten the antenna. To move to a lower frequency, I lengthen the antenna. So here we have a quarter wave vertical antenna. And here's my, my prop. Here's a quarter wave vertical antenna. It doesn't look like the dipole. It's, it's, it's missing part of, the, part of the antenna. What's going on here? Well, these are called radials. And what happens is that you think of the radials as mirrors. Here's one half of the antenna, and the other half of the antenna is mirrored down into the ground, which is why you were talking about that underground antenna. I'm trying to think of, you know, it's kind of like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but what happens um, is if you have a vertical antenna, this is a quarter wavelength, and the quarter wavelength is, is mirrored from the ground, you still have a, a half wavelength dipole, it's just you only can see half of it here. Um, and will this antenna work without the radials? No. I liken it to in a swimming pool, if you're going to kick yourself off of the side of the pool, uh, you, you put your legs out and you push against the side of the pool. Well, without the radials, this guy's got nothing to push against. And so you go nowhere. So if you're going to have a quarter wavelength vertical, you must have radials of, of some type. See this little thing right here? What, what do we, we talked about, that's a coil. That's an inductor. And what an inductor will do when it's in a configuration like this, it makes the antenna look electrically longer than it really is. So electrically, this antenna looks like this is a, maybe that long. But because I've added that loading coil in there, I can physically shorten the antenna, but still make it electrically work on a lower frequency. You'll see that again here in just a second. Some, uh, on some mobile uh, antennas, you can see you can buy a quarter wavelength antenna. And, and that kind of an antenna uses the body of the car 
as, as the radial uh, portion. Um, but you can also buy something called a 5 8 wavelength antenna. And why would you want to do that? Well, a f quarter wavelength antenna is going to have uh, an angle of radiation up about like this. So all the way around the antenna, it's going to kind of go up. But a 5 8 wavelength antenna that's longer is going to force that radiation down lower, which gives you increased range, especially in a mobile application. So you have to have some impedance matching, an L match network there to, to feed it. Um, but that's why people will buy 5 8 wave antennas versus quarter wave antennas in order to get that slightly increased gain. No more than about 2 dB, but people are working, for, you know, looking for all they can get. And roof mounting of an antenna on a vehicle right on the, the top of the roof provides the most uniform pattern from that antenna. If you can mount it on the side, um, on my avalanche downstairs, you can take a look and it's mounted by the engine compartment. My, my antenna radiation pattern is not uniform. It, it favors the direction of the car body because there's nothing to push against over there. And loading coils, like that little coil there, you can put a loading coil uh, in the middle of a vertical radiator and make it look electrically longer. That's called a loaded antenna. And we're talking about the Yagi antennas uh, being a directional antenna. Well, satellite antennas are highly directional antennas um, with a very uh, strong main lobe and then they've got some side lobes. We saw those earlier. Just want you to know that uh, this is one class of directional antenna. Um, the Yagi antennas that we talked about, in this case a three element Yagi antenna with a driven element which is a half wavelength long, the director which is about 5% shorter, the reflector which is about 5% longer and it directs energy in, in that direction. Cubicle quad antennas. Um, this was uh, invented at radio station HCJB in Quito, Ecuador. Uh, they're very high altitude there, and they had a problem. They were using, this is a religious broadcasting shortwave station. They were using a Yagi antenna, but up at that altitude, because of the, the high voltage is at the end of dipole antennas, the tips were melting off because of arcing, because of the altitude. So. Um, Clarence Moore, um, the chief engineer at the station, literally prayed uh, about what kind of antenna could he come up with and got his engineering books out too. And this is a God-inspired antenna. It's a full wavelength a driven element and then directors and reflectors, 5% shorter, 5% longer. It works and there is no high voltage point at which to arc over. So this antenna stayed up. And hams can use their transceivers and standing wave meters to, to, to measure antennas, but they can also use something like this. This is an antenna analyzer from MFJ. It's kind of like a little transmitter, frequency agile transmitter in a box with metering as well. So you can use this to find the resonant frequency of an antenna. Uh, should it be longer or should it be shorter? Um, don't have to actually have a transmitter, transmit a signal. So on your uh, Baofeng or other HT, this is not the antenna that came with it. This is not the stock antenna. The stock antenna is only about that long. They're not very effective, uh, the stock antennas, and especially in a car because of the shielding effect of the body of the car, uh, you need an outside antenna for mobile use. And if you can replace the little rubber ducky antenna with something more substantial like this, you also get an increase in performance from your radio. And the connectors uh, that are used for radio frequency energy on the bow fangs here, for example, they use something called an SMA connector. Now, this is one kind of coaxial RF uh, connector. Um, but the, you can see there's a, a variety of them up there. Um, the, the two that I'd like you to note, if I can get this screwed back on again, are the PL259, which is also known as a UHF connector. That's this one down here. It's the most popular 
type of antenna connector or cable connector uh, in HF. And then this guy right here, the N connector. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, those are, are two common connectors uh, in amateur radio. Uh, some others, the SMA, like what I talked about here, a BNC, a bayonet connector. Uh, that's also fairly popular. The PL259 is the most popular. It's called a UHF connector, but really it's only good up till about maybe two meters. Beyond that, you've got to move to a different connector. Um, and putting a PL259 connector together, um, the original style requires that you solder um, not only the center conductor of the coaxial cable, we have to solder the, the braid, the shield as well. Um, you use rosin core solder and a really heavy duty soldering uh, gun or iron uh, to, to make that happen. And it's, it's hard not to melt the cable when you're doing that. I've gone to crimp connectors where you actually still solder the center conductor using rosin core solder, um, but then you crimp the shield. And that, for me, uh, works the best. Some people love them, some people hate them. And the end connector uh, was invented by Dr. Neal of uh, AT&T. They needed a connector that was good for UHF um, systems that they were using uh, for the Bell system. And so this is a double insulated uh, shielded connector and this one is waterproof. And what did I say about water and coaxial cable? It's the enemy, so this, this is very helpful in that regard. But the end connector is best for use above 400 megahertz. And again, if you're going to be soldering, not so many people, now we use a plastic uh, pipe for plumbing, but it used to be that you know, people use metal uh, pipes for plumbing and they get acid core solder. You don't want to use acid core solder on electronics. Always rosin core solder. The acid will actually eat away the wire and the printed circuit board. You don't want that. If you are soldering, which is, is melting a, a mixture of lead and tin to make a connection, uh, you want to make sure that your connection is shiny and continuous. You can see we got some problems going on here uh, with some breakups, um, and that's going to be a bad connection on that printed circuit board. And a cold solder joint um, is something that is dull and grainy in appearance. If you see that, you want to re-solder it again with some fresh solder uh, to make it shiny. All right, last questions. Almost home. What antenna polarization is normally used for long distance weak signal CW, Morse code, and single sideband contacts using the VHF and UHF bands? You might have to think back. Remember, I, I talked to you about uh, all those mobile guys on VHF and UHF. Their antennas are vertically polarized. Well, if you're looking for weak signals, you want to go horizontal. So the answer here is horizontal polarization. And when using a directional antenna, how might your station be able to access a distant repeater if buildings or obstructions are blocking the direct line of sight? Exactly. Think of my channel 7 signal. I had to find a, a path that would reflect it. Okay. And the proper location for an external SWR meter in series with the feed line between the transmitter and the antenna. That's where you put it. And which of the following instruments can be used to determine if an antenna is resonant at the desired operating frequency? That's that black box I showed you up there, the antenna analyzer. And what instrument other than an SWR meter could you use to determine if a feed line and an antenna are properly matched? Directional watt, Directional watt meter. I like that iambic pentameter, but I don't think that'll measure anything for us. <laughs> and which of the following is the most common cause for failure of coaxial cables? Water, moisture, and why should the outer jacket of coaxial cable be resistant to UV light? 
water, moisture. And what is the disadvantage of air core coaxial cable when compared to foam or solid dielectric types? Think about the nitrogen tank. It requires special techniques to prevent water absorption. And which of the following types of solder is best for radio? Rosin core. And what is the characteristic impedance of a cold solder joint? A grainy or dull surface. And what is a beam antenna? An antenna that concentrates signals in one direction. And which of the following describes a type of antenna loading? Put in the coil to make it look electrically longer. And which of the following describes a simple dipole oriented parallel to the Earth's surface? A simple dipole oriented parallel to the Earth's surface. A horizontally polarized antenna. And what is the disadvantage of the rubber duck antenna supplied with the most uh, handhelds? It doesn't transmit or receive as effectively as a full size quarter wave. Yep. I like that if the rubber end cap is lost, it will unravel. <laughs> and how would you change a dipole antenna to make it resonant on a higher frequency? Higher frequency. Shorten it. Exactly. And what type of antennas are the quad, the yagi, and the dish? Those are directional antennas. And what is the disadvantage of using a handheld VHF transceiver with its integral antenna inside a vehicle? The shielding effect of the vehicle will prevent you from receiving and transmitting very well. OK. What is the approximate length in inches of a quarter wavelength vertical antenna for 146 megahertz? So 146 megahertz, if you look at your color chart, you'll find is in the two meter band. All right, let's see. So this is two meters. This is a, a meter stick. And this is two meters long, so a half wavelength. What are we looking for here? No, we're looking for a quarter wavelength, sorry. So a half wavelength is going to be one meter, which is that. That's one meter. And so da, 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 da. right there. So how long do you think that is in inches? 19 inches would be correct. And so you can do this one of two ways. You can do it in your head and get it into you know, half a meter and then convert that to inches. Uh, or you can use the formula 468 divided by the frequency in megahertz to give you a half wavelength and then divide that in half. And that'll give you also, but that's going to give you an answer in feet. Or you can just memorize the answer. All right, and what is the approximate length in inches of a half wavelength, half wavelength, six meter dipole antenna? So a half wavelength is going to be three meters. How long do you think that's going to be in inches? Natalie's got it, 112, exactly. And in which direction does a half wavelength dipole radiate the strongest signal? Broadside to the antenna. And what is an advantage of using a properly mounted 5 8 wave antenna for VHF or UHF mobile service? It brings that angle of radiation down so it has slightly greater range, so it's say. 
And what is the major function of an antenna tuner? It makes the transmitter happy. It matches the antenna system to the transceiver's output impedance. And which of the following connectors is most suitable for frequencies above 400 megahertz? Think of Mr. Neal of AT&T, the type N connector. And which of the following is true of PL259, or UHF coax connectors? They're the most common kind of connector you're going to see. And they're commonly used at high frequencies. And why should coax connectors exposed to the weather be sealed against water? Water to prevent feed line loss. That's why you tape them up or you use coax seal or some other method to do it. And what is the electrical difference between RG58, small, RG8, big coaxial cable? The bigger cable, the RG8, has lower loss at any frequency between the two. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of chapter four. You made it. Congratulations. See you next week. <laughs>